In this video, we will solve O-Level Mathematics Paper 2, Variant 2 for May-June 2016. So let's start. Question number one is, each year uh, the Reds plays the Blues in a baseball match. In 2015, there were 40,500 tickets sold for the, for the match. In 2015, the number of tickets sold was 2.4% more than in 2014. Calculate uh, calculate the number of tickets sold uh, for the match in 2015. So the tickets sold in 2015 are 2.4% higher or you can say they are 102.4% of 40,500. So tickets sold in 2015 are equal to 102.4% of tickets sold in 2014 which are 40,500. So what is 102.4% of 40,500? It's 102.4 divided by 100 into 40,500 which is equals to, so let me bring in my calculator here. So 102.4 divided by 100 into 40,500. So your answer is 41,472 tickets were sold in 2015. 41,472. In 2015, uh, the cost per ticket was $68.25. The cost per ticket for the match increased by 5% from 2015 to 2015. Oh, sorry, 2014 to 2015. Calculate the cost per ticket for the match in 2015. 14. So let's say let the cost of ticket uh, in 2014 equals to x dollars. Now we are given that the cost increased by 5%. So the cost of ticket in 2015 is 105% of x. So cost of ticket in 2015 2015 equals to 105% so there's a 5% increase so 105% of uh, x which is the cost in 2014 so what is the cost of ticket in 2015 you're given that this is 68.25 so 68.25 equals to what is 105% of x it is 105 over 100 into x so from this you can find x it will be i will take this 100 to the other side it will be multiplied in the numerator so this will be 68.25 multiplied by 100 and then this 105 will be in the denominator so your value of x will be let me use the calculator 68.25 multiplied by 100 divided by 105 so this is 65 so your answer is the cost of ticket in 2014 was $65. If you want, you can use the ratio method as well. So in 2014 and then ratio 2015, uh, you know that there was a 5% increase. So in, if 2014, if in 2014, the price was 100, in 2015, it would be 105 because of the 5% increase. And then in 2014, you have to find the actual cost, which is X, which is the unknown. And uh, the price is 68.25 in 2015 and then you can cross multiply because they are directly proportional uh, the percentage and the actual cost so once you uh, cross multiply you get 105x equals to 68.25 into 100 68.25 multiplied by 100 and this is basically the same equation uh, as this one that we solved uh, this equation here. Uh, so this will give you the same answer. Part C is calculate the percentage increase from 2015 to 2015, oh sorry, 2014 to 2015 in the total money taken for the match. So to find the percentage increase from 2014 to 2015, you need to first find the total money taken in 2014 and then total money taken in 2015. So total money total money taken in 2014 will be ticket price 
ticket sorry ticket price multiplied by tickets sold tickets sold so what's the ticket price in 2014 it's 65 multiplied by ticket sold in 2014 so ticket sold in 2014 is given here this is 40500 so if i multiply these i will get 65 times 40500 this is equals to 2632500 and then you have to find similarly total money taken in 2015 so it will be the same ticket price ticket price in 2015 was this 68.25 68.25 multiplied by the number of tickets sold which is this 41472 41472 so now this is 68.25 multiplied by 41472 this is 2830464 so 2830464 now you have to find the percentage increase so percentage increase will be the increase in money taken so uh, in money taken in 2015 minus money taken in 2014. So this is the increase 2830464 minus uh, 2632500 two, and then divided by the orig uh, original amount in 2014 which is this. So we are calculating the percentage increase. This is the initial value. This is the final value. So you always divide by the initial value to find the percentage increase. So Sorry, this will be initial value, which is 2632500. And then you multiply it by 100 to get the percentage. So let's calculate this. 28, this minus uh, 2632500 divided by 2632500 and then into 100 so this is 7.52 percent 7.52 so your answer here is 7.52 the next question is uh you're given vectors jk kl and lm part one is find jm so jm using the head to tail rule i can find it by adding jk plus kl plus lm so jk plus kl plus lm using the head to tail rule this will give you uh, jm so what is jk 25 plus 4 minus 2 plus minus 1 3 4 plus 2 is 6 6 minus 1 is 5 so this will be 5 5 minus 2 is 3 and 3 plus 3 is 6 so JM is given by 5, 6. Calculate the magnitude KL. So you know the formula for calculating the magnitude of a vector. You will simply take the square of these two values and add them and then take the full square root. So this will be 4 square plus minus 2 square and full square root. So this will be 16. This will be 4. This will be square root of 20. So you can, if you want, you can calculate the square root. I will leave this answer as it is, square root of 20. Part B is, uh, in the diagram, OA vector is A, OB is B, C is the point such that OAC is a straight line, and AC equals to 2 times OA. So AC is twice the, uh, this OA. So if this is vector A, this AC will be, 2a d is the midpoint of ob d is the midpoint so od will be half b and db will also be 1 over 2b e is the point such that ec equals to od so ec is equals to this od 
since OD D is the midpoint, so this is half B and half B here. So OD and EC are the same, so EC will also be 1 over 2 B. Express as simply as possible in terms of A and B, uh, the vector AD. So vector AD will be this AO plus OD. So I can find AD equals to AO plus OD. AO is this. So if this is A in this direction, in the AO, OA is A. So AO will be minus A. So AO is minus A plus OD is what? 1 over 2B. 1 over 2B. So this is minus A plus 1 over 2B. Part B, uh, the vector EB. So vector EB is this one. So using the head to tail rule, I can find EB by adding EC, then this CO, and then OB. So let's write it down. EB will be EC plus CO plus OB. So what is EC? EC is 1 by 2B. What is CO? This full vector OC is 3A, 2A plus A. So this vector CO will be minus 3A. And then OB, OB is simply B plus B. So I can add 1 over 2B plus B. Uh, that will be minus 3A plus uh, 3 over 2B. So this is minus 3a plus 3 over 2b. Part 2 is find the ratio of magnitude of eb, uh, ratio uh, magnitude of ad. So one way would be to find the actual magnitudes of eb and then find the magnitude of ad. But if you look at these answers that you have calculated in the previous part, uh, you don't need to go that long, uh, take the, the longer uh, way of calculating these magnitudes and then comparing them to get the ratio because this is just one mark. So if I write these uh, vectors as it is that I have computed in the previous two parts, what is EB? EB is minus 3A plus 3 by 2B and then ratio AD is what? Minus A plus 1 by 2B. Now if I take 3 common outside from this, I get minus a plus 1 by 2b ratio minus a plus 1 by 2b. So I can actually cancel these two and I am left with uh, 3 ratio 1. So you get the answer straight away. You don't have to like calculate the magnitudes to compare. So this is 3 ratio 1. Question 3 is Stephen asked 25 women how many children do they have? The results are summarized in the table below. So 7 women had 0 children, 5 had 1 children, 6 women had 2 children and so on. Part 1 is find the mean. So mean will be you will multiply the each like number of children with the corresponding frequency and add them together and then divide by 25 because the total women uh, in the survey are uh, 25. So it will be 0 times 7 plus 1 times 5 plus 2 times 6 plus 3 times 4 plus 4 times 3 and then whole divide by 25. So if I use my calculator here, this is 7 times 0 is 0. So this will be 5 plus 12 plus 12 plus 12 and divide by 25. This is 1.64. So your answer is 1.64. So the next part is median. So you have 25 women uh, in the survey. So your median will be the, you add one once, since you have an odd number here. So you add one and then divide by two, which is 26 divided by two, which is the 13th value. So which is the 13th value? So your first seven values are zero. So your range here is one till the seventh value, seventh value. And then five, another five are, so no, number of women with one children are five. So you have first seven values here, the next five values here. So this will be eighth till 12th values. 
and then you have another 6 here so 7 plus 5 is 12 and 12 plus 6 is 18 so this will be 13th till 18th value so 13th till 18th value will all be 2 so your 13th value here is 2 so your median is 2 if you want you can actually expand these and find the 13th value so what you will do is your zeros occur seven times so one two three four five six seven then you have one which is five times one two three four five you have six uh, two which is which has a frequency of six so one two three four five six now if you count one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen so this is your 13th value which is two and this is your median the mod will be the value which has the highest frequency so the highest frequency is 7 and the corresponding value is this 0 so your mod is 0 part b is uh, steven says that the mod is the average uh, that best represents the data explain why steven is wrong so mod is not the average value mod is the most common value because it has the highest frequency so mod is the most common value and here uh, the average which is the mean here average equals to 1.64 and mod is what zero and mod is equals to zero so average is not equal to mod the next part is Steven chooses two women at random from the group calculate the probability that both of them have just one child give your answer as a fraction in its simplest form so you're looking for probability one child and one child so you are choosing two women and you want what is you want to calculate what is the probability that both have just one child so the frequency for one is five so there are five women out of the total 25 that have one child so if you pick the first one what is the probability of uh, choosing a woman with one child it's 5 over 25 right so this will be 5 over 25 and then what is the probability of choosing a woman with one child again now you are left with four women who have one child because you have already chosen one and then the total woman is also one less because you have already chosen one woman so this will be 4 over 24 so this will be 5 times 4 is 20 and 25 times 24 will be 600 so this will be 20 over 600 and this can be simplified to 1 over uh, 0 zeros cancel out and then 1 over 30 so if you want you can draw that probability tree diagram as well so you have starting in the first you have how many options uh, there are 0 1 2 3 4 so you have 0 child then you have one child then you have two children and so on so you are just interested in, the, in this branch so what is the probability of uh, choosing woman with one child it's uh, 5 over 5 which is the number of women with one child 5 over 25 so this will be this branch here will be 5 over 25 and then you branch it off again 0 child 1 child 2 children and so on I, I won't draw the rest so now what is the probability of one child again because if you you want to follow this path this here and then this here that's how you will end up uh, with women uh, two women that that have one child both women have one child so then this is four because there are only four women remaining with one child and then total women remaining are 24 so then you multiply these two uh, to get the probability that uh, both women that you have chosen have just one child So the next part is draw a bar chart to represent this data so let me quickly copy this table below so you have number of children here number of children so 0 1 
two, three, four, and the frequencies are seven, five, six, four, three. So you have frequency seven, five, six, four, three. So now we can draw this bar chart here. So you have number of children. So you start with zero, then you have one, two, three, and four. And for zero, your frequency is seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I can just make one box represent one value. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So zero children, the frequency is seven. So seven is here. So you should use a ruler to make sure your lines are straight. Uh, I'm not doing that. So my lines may not be perfectly straight here. And then one has a frequency of five. So one has a frequency of five. This is how you will draw this. And then two has a frequency of six. So six is here. Then three has a frequency of four. So three has a frequency of four here. And then four has a frequency of three. So four has a frequency of three. So this is how you will complete the bar chart. The next part is uh, Steven shows Frank uh, the paper on which he recorded the data from his survey. Part of the paper has been torn. Which five numbers are missing from the paper? So you know the frequencies of each number and we'll see which numbers are missing. So zero has a frequency of seven. So how many zeros do you have? One, two, three, four, five. That means uh, this paper, that part that is missing has two more zeros. So zero and zero, two zeros are missing. Then number of children, one has a frequency of five. So how many ones do you have? One two, three, four. So four, that means one, uh, one is missing. So you, you're missing one. And then two has a frequency of six. So how many twos do you have? One, two, three, four, five, six. So all the twos are present. So you don't need to write any twos. Uh, three has a frequency of four. One, two, Three. So we have three threes. One three is missing. So I will write three here. And four has a frequency of three. So we have one, two. So you have two fours. One four is missing as well. So four. So zero, zero, one, three, four. These are the numbers that were missing that were part of this paper that is torn off. Question number four is triangle ABC has sides AB eight centimeter, AC seven, and BC 12 centimeters. Use a ruler and compass to construct triangle ABC. Side AB has been drawn for you. So this side AB which has been drawn is 8 cm. So we are given that AC is 7 cm. So I'll use my compass and ruler here to draw an arc which is 7 cm away from the point A. So I'll open up my compass till 7 cm. And so this is 7. I'll place it at point A here and then draw an arc like this. And then I am given that BC is 12 centimeters. So I will open up my compass to 12 centimeter now. So this was seven and then this is about 12 centimeters. And then I'll place it at this point B now and draw an arc which intersects the arc that I've already already drawn to give me uh, the location of point C. So this point here will be point C because the distance from A of this point is seven centimeters and distance of this point from B is 12 centimeters where these two arcs intersects. So let me quickly draw the lines as well. So I'll use my ruler here.
So this is BC. And then for AC, we'll draw a line like this. So this will be your point C. The next part is measure the angle BAC. So I'll use my protractor here to measure this angle. So I'll place it here at point A and then align my zero degrees here with this line. And then if I look at here, this is 100 degrees. So this is 105 and this is 106 degrees. So angle BAC is about 106, 106 degrees. Next part is calculate the interior angle of a regular 12 sided polygon. So we can calculate the sum of all angles of this polygon of all angles of this polygon and we know the formula for that which is n minus 2 into 180 where n is the number of sides so we're given it's 12 sides so this will be 12 minus 2 into 180 which is equals to 10 into 180 which is 1800 so since this is a regular sided regular 12 sided polygon that means each of the angles or each of the 12 angles are equal. So let the interior angle that we have to find, let interior angle equals to X. So if one interior angle is X, the sum of all interior angles will be 12 X. And we know that the sum is 1800. So 12 X should equal 1800. So X will be 1800 divided by 12, which is 150 degrees. So the interior angle of this regular 12 sided polygon will be 150 degrees. Part C is the diagram shows a hexagon with two parallel sides and one horizontal line of symmetry. So that means if these two are parallel sides, the line of symmetry, which is also horizontal is like this. And this line of symmetry will also be parallel to these two sides. So the first part is calculate the angle P. So if this is the line of symmetry, that means it will divide this angle P into half. So this angle above the line of symmetry will be P over two. Now using the property of a line, which is intersecting two parallel lines. So this P by two plus 125 is actually the sum of the interior angles of two parallel lines. So Using the property of interior angles of uh, parallel lines, I will write P by 2 plus 125 should be equal to uh, 125 should equal to 180 degrees because the sum of interior angles is 180. And then P by 2 will be 180 minus 125. And this will give me P. So let me bring in the calculator here. So I have 180 minus 125 and then the answer is multiplied by 2. So P will be P, P will be 110 degrees. So your answer is 110 degrees. Part 2 is calculate Q. So if this angle is Q here, then this angle is also Q because this is the line of symmetry. And if this angle is 3P, then this angle here so let me actually mark this in green so let's call this angle x so let's first find x and then if i know x i can uh, write this angle as x over 2 and then i can use this quadrilateral so let me uh, in fact let me mark this in red so this is the quadrilateral that i am looking at to find the value of q because i can use the property of quadrilaterals that the sum of their interior angles is 360 degrees. So I am looking at all the interior angles of this quadrilateral. So let's first find X. 
So I'm given that 3p plus x will be equal to 360 degree. This will give me 3p uh, will be, so 110 uh, is p, so 3p will be 330. So x is 360 minus 330, which gives me 30 degrees. So this angle, full angle is 30 degrees. That means this angle here is 15 degrees. So now I can add up all the interior angles of this quadrilateral that I have marked in red. So 125 plus this is P by 2, which is 55 plus this 15 degrees plus this Q should equal 360 degrees. So Q will be 360 minus the sum of these three. So the sum will be 125 plus 55 plus 15, 195 and 360 minus 195, you will get 165 degrees. So this is 165. So your angle Q is 165 degrees. So let's move on to the next part. Part D is a trapezium PQRS is similar to trapezium ABCD. So these two trapeziums are similar. AB is parallel to DC and ABC is 90 degrees. You're given that DC is 2AB, BC is half AB and PQ is 3 by 4 DC. Given that BC equals to X centimeters. So this length BC is X. Find an expression in terms of X for the area of this larger trapezium PQRS. So if we can find the area of this smaller trapezium, we can use the property of similar shapes that the ratio of their areas will be equal to the ratio of their corresponding length, square of the ratio of their corresponding length. So that means if I take this length, suppose this length AB and the corresponding length is PQ, so AB and PQ, so the ratio AB over PQ and if I take the square of this ratio, it will be equal to the ratio of area of ABCD, area of ABCD divided by area, area of PQRS. So this is the property of uh, similar shapes. So now <clears throat> first I need to find the area of this trapezium ABCD. So I'm given BC is X centimeters. Then I'm given DC is uh, two times AB and BC is half AB. So if BC is half AB, from this, I get AB is two times BC. So if BC is X, AB will be two X, right? So this gives me AB equals to two X. And then I'm given DC is two times AB. So DC equals to two times AB, which is equals to DC will be two times AB. AB is two X, so two into two X, which is four X. So this DC is four X. Now I can calculate the area of this because I know the height. I know the parallel sides as well. So let's calculate area of ABCD will be one by two into the height, which is X into sum of parallel sides, which is two X plus four X. So this will be four plus two, six X. Uh, this will be six X square over two, which is three X square. So I'm also given this PQ is three by four DC. So PQ equals to three by four DC. Three by four DC, DC is what? Four X. So three by four into four X, four and four cancel out. So PQ is three X. Now I know AB, I know PQ is three X. I know the area of ABCD is three X square. Now I can use the this property of similar shapes to calculate the area of PQRS. So let me invert these uh, fractions on both sides. So I have area of PQRS uh, in the numerator. So I will say uh, area of PQRS over area of ABCD is equals to the length PQ over the length AB whole squared. So now I will substitute the value. So let me continue here. So area of PQRS is still unknown. 
area of PQRS is unknown. Area of ABCD is 3x square. 3x square. And then PQ is what? 3x. And AB is 2x. And then I have to take the square of the ratios. So if I this I, I can take this 3x square to the other side. So I will get area of PQRS equals to. So let me first calculate the square. These x and x will cancel out. So this will be 3, 3s are 9 over 4 and then multiplied by this 3x squared. So this area of PQRS will be 9 times 3 is 27. 27 over 4x squared. So your answer is 27 over 4 x square centimeter square. The next question, question 5, part A, uh, factorize fully 8x square y minus 12x power 5. So from this I can take 4x square as common. Then I will be left with 2y here minus 3x uh, cube. So cube and 2 will uh, if I open the bracket, I'll get x power 5 back. So this will be your final answer. You cannot uh, factorize this any further. So your answer will be 4x square into 2y minus 3x cube. Part B is solve this equation. So if I open this bracket, I will get 4x minus 2x minus 10 equals to 3. 4x minus 2x will be 2x. And then if I take this 10 to the other side, I will get 13. 10 plus 3 and then x will be 13 over 2 which is 6.5. Solve this inequality 7 minus 5y is less than 20. So I can take this 7 to the other side. I will get minus 5y is less than 20 minus 7 will be 13. And then I can multiply by minus sign on both sides. So I get positive 5y and then since I'm multiplying by minus 1 or like minus sign on both sides I will switch this inequality this will become greater than and this will be minus 13 and then y will be greater than uh, minus 13 over 5 so y is greater than minus 13 over 5 the next part is uh, you are given a rectangle that has length 2x centimeter, perimeter is 18, and area is 10 centimeter square. Show that 2x square minus 9x plus 5 equals to 0. So we are given the length, the only unknown is the width. So we can find the width uh, using either the perimeter or the area, and then substitute that uh, width into uh, the other. Uh, like if you use perimeter to find the width, then we can. Uh, use the width and the length to calculate the area which should give you this equation. So let's uh, find, let's first call let uh, width equals to w. So now the perimeter is 2 times 2x plus w should equal 18. And then 2x plus w will be 9 if I take 2 to the other side. And w will be 9 minus 2x. So 9 minus 2x centimeter is your width. So now you can use the area is what length into width area is given 10 centimeter square length is what 2x and width is 9 minus 2x. Now if I open this bracket I will get 18x minus 4x. So let's take everything to the left so that I can have a positive x square coefficient here this side is negative sorry this is x square. So if I take everything to the left of this equation, I will get 4x square minus 18x plus 10 equals to 0. Now this is 2x square minus 9x plus 5. So this is actually twice the this equation here is twice uh, of this. So I can divide on two divide by two on both sides of the equation. So 0 divided by 2 will remain 0. So if I divide by 2 on the left side, I will get 2x square or if you want to show this you can take 2 common so I will get 2x square minus 9x plus 5 equals to 0 and then if I take 2 to the other side 0 divided by 2 is still 0 so 2x square minus 9x plus 15 will give you 0. Second part is solve 2x square minus 9x plus 5 equals to 0 giving your answer correct to two decimal places. So since this will be in decimal 
uh, I can use the quadratic formula uh, which is x equals to minus b plus minus square root of b square minus 4ac over 2a so let me substitute the values minus b will be minus minus 9 plus minus square root of b square is minus 9 square minus 4 times a is 2 and c is 5 and then this whole thing is divided by 2a which is 2 times 2 so uh, i will get plus 9 outside plus 9 plus minus square root of so let's actually calculate this 9 square is 81 and this is 5 twos are 10 10 into 4 40 so i will get uh, 81 minus 40 81 minus 40 will be 41 so square root of 41 divided by uh, 4 so then I'll continue here so x is either 9 plus square root of 41 divided by 4 or x equals to 9 minus square root of 41 divided by 4 so square root of 41 will be this 6.403 then plus 9 plus 9 and then divided by 4 so your answer will be 3.850 so this will be I have to write it up till two decimal places so this is 3.85 and here I will get again I will do square root of 41 which is 6.4 and then I will multiply it by minus 1 because I have to take uh, sorry uh, square root of again I'll do it again 41 square root then multiplied by 1 minus 1 which is minus 6.4 then plus 9 and then divide by 4 so your final answer here is 0 0.649 so up to up till two decimal place i will round this up so i will get uh, 0 0.65 so these are the two possible values of x 3.85 or 0.65 Part 3 is find the difference between the length and the width of the rectangle. So we are given that length is 2x. So length equals to 2x. So I can use um, either values of uh, x. Both will give me the correct answer. So it seems like the length is the longer side 2x. So I can use the bigger value of x here. So 2 into 3.85 which will be... 2 multiplied by 3.85 I'll get 7.7 .7, so the length is 7.7 .7 centimeters and then the width is so width I know is 9 minus 2x so 9 minus 2x uh, so instead of x I will write 3.85 so this will be 9 minus 7.7 .7, 9 minus 7.7 .7, which is uh 1.3 centimeters so the difference difference will be 7.7 .7 minus 1.3 uh which is 7 minus 3 is 4 and 7 minus 6 is 6 6 point 7 minus 3 is 4 7 minus 1 is 6 okay so this is 6.4 centimeters the difference between the length and the width Question 6 is you are given a universal set then A is a set of prime numbers, B is a set of even numbers and C is a set of numbers that are multiple of 5. So let's first populate these sets. So A is uh, where X is a prime number. So let's see which are the prime numbers from this. Uh, you have 2, 3, 5, uh, 7 and 11 these are the prime numbers from this universal set and then let's write down b as well uh, b is the set of even numbers so even numbers will be 2 4 6 8 
10 and 12. And then C are the numbers that are multiples of 5. So multiples of 5 are 5 and 10 only. 5 and 10. So first we have to list the members of the subset B intersection C. So B intersection C, uh, what are the common elements between B and C? So you only have one common element, which is 10. Part B is uh, A union B union C and then complement. So let's first find this union A union B union C will be uh, the elements that are present in A, then all the elements in B, and then all the elements in C, since it's a union. But you have to make sure you do not repeat any elements. So let's first write down all the elements of A, which are 2, 3, 5, 7, and 11. And then all the elements of B, making sure you do not repeat. So 2 is already here. 4, 6, 8, uh, 10, and then 12 and then all the elements of C uh, 5 is already here 10 is already here so you don't need to add any others so this is A union B union C now you have to find the complement of this that means uh, any elements that are outside of this set uh, which are not present in these so this is your universal set so let's see which of the elements are missing from this union uh, that are all present in the universal set those will be the complement of this union so 2 is here 3 is also present 4 is missing oh no in fact 4 is here 5 is also here 6 is also present 7 8 9 so you have 9 is not part of this union so 9 is part of the complement of this union 10 is present, 11 is there, and 12 is there. So the only element that's not present in this set, which is part of the uh, universal set, is 9. The next part is A intersection B complement. So let's first find the B complement. B complement is what? So B is this. So which are the elements that are not present in B, but present in the universal set? Those will be the elements of B complement. So 2 is here, 3 is missing, so 3, 4 is present, 5 is not there. So that is, since B is even number, a B complement will be all the uh, odd numbers. So 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11. So this is B complement. This is A. So you have to find the common elements in A and B complement, which will give you this intersection. So which are the common elements? Uh, 2 is not present here, 3 is present. So 3 is in the intersection, 5 is also present, 5, 7 is also here, 7, 11 is also here, so 3, 5, 7 and 11. 9 is present here but 9 is absent here, so A intersection B complement will be 3, 5, 7 and 11. Part 2 is a number Q is chosen at random from this universal set. Find the probability that Q belongs to A intersection B complement. So A intersection B complement is this. So number of elements in A uh, intersection B complement is how many? 1, 2, 3, 4. So you have 4 elements out of these 11. So number of uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So number of elements in the universal set is how many? 11. So if you pick any uh, random number from this set, the probability that it will be in this set is 4 over 11 because out of these 11, 4 are part of this uh, set, uh, A intersection, B complement. So probability that Q that you pick belongs to A intersection, B complement will be 4 over 11. Part B is you are given matrix X, which is 3 minus 1, 2, 0 and matrix Y. Part 1 is find 2X plus Y. So 2X will be 2 times 3 minus 1, 2, 0 plus Y will be 2 minus 1, 2, 1. And then if I multiply this 2 inside, I will get 6 minus 2, 4 and 0 plus this matrix, which is 2, 2 minus 1 and 1 and then if I add these I will get 8 minus 2 plus 2 will be 0 4 minus 1 will be 3 0 plus 1 will be 1 
So your answer is 8, 0, 3, and 1. The next part is find y inverse. So to find y inverse, you first need to find the determinant of y, which will be the product of these two, 2 and 1. So 2 times 1 minus the product of these two, which is 2 times minus 1, 2 times minus 1. So this is 2, this is also, this is minus 2, minus and minus becomes plus, so this is 2 plus 2, which is 4. So y inverse will be 1 over determinant, which is 1 over 4, multiplied by the adjugate of y. So how do you find the adjugate of y? Uh, you swap the places of these two. <clears throat> So 1 will move here, 2 will move here, and then you change the sign of the other 2. So minus 1 uh, will become positive 1, and this 2 will become negative 2. And then I can move this 1 over 4 inside, I will get 1 over 4. Minus 2 over 4 will be minus 1 over 2. This will be 1 over 4 as well, and 2 over 4 will be 1 over 2. So this will be 1 by 4 minus 1 by 2, 1 by 4 and 1 over 2. The next question is, uh, one day uh, Garage A records the amount of petrol bought by the first 120 customers. The results are summarized in the table below. So you have petrol in liters and number of customers. So uh, 9 customers bought petrol between 0 and 10 liters, uh, 13 customers bought petrol between 10 and 20 liters, and so on. And then you have the cumulative frequency here, so you have to com complete the cumulative frequency table. So cumulative frequency is just the sum of the frequencies up till that point, so this is 9 as it is. Then you get 9 plus 13, which is 22. Then you have to add 22 plus 36, so let me use my calculator. 22 plus 36 will be 58 here. And then you can simply uh, keep adding on to your cumulative frequency. So 58 plus 30 uh, will give you 88. Then 88 plus 16 will give you 104. 104 plus 9 will give you 113. 113 plus 5 will give you 118 and then 118 plus 2 will give you 120. So on the grid below, draw the cumulative frequency curve to represent this data. So on the x-axis, you have petrol in liters and on the y-axis, you have cumulative frequency. So for so here, each small block will represent a value of 0 0.5 because there are uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oh, so there are 10 blocks. So each small block will represent a value of 1. And here each small block will represent a value of 2 because between 0 and 10, there are only 5 blocks. So your first value is uh, k is less than or equal to 10. So this is 10 on the x-axis and the cumulative frequency is 9. So 9 will be uh, in the middle of this. Uh, small block because this is 10, this is 8, so 9 will be in between. So this is 9 here. Then 22 and 20. So cumulative frequency is 22. On the x axis, you have 20. So this is 20, and this one small block above will be 22. Then you have 58, 30 and 58. So 30 and 58 will be this one. Then you have 40 and 88. 40 and 88 will be this one. Then you have 50 and 104. 50 and 104. 60 and 113, 60 and 113. So this is 110, 112, 113 will be in the middle here. 70 and 118, 70 and 118 will be here. And then 80 and 120, 80 and 120. So this is uh, the plot. And now you can start from 0, 0 to draw this cumulative frequency curve. So let's start from this point here. 
will start to rise like this. Uh, let me try again. So this is how you will uh, draw this graph. So I missed this point a little bit, but you get the idea. So this will be your uh, cumulative frequency curve that represents this data. The next part is use your graph to estimate the median. So median will be at the 50th percentile. So median will be when uh, CF is cumulative frequency. I'm just writing the short form. When CF is 50% of 120 because the total number of customers they surveyed was 120. So first 120 customers. So 50% of 120 when cumulative frequency is 50% of 120 which is 60. So now you have to look at the value uh, in liters of petrol when your cumulative frequency is 60. So 50% of uh, 120. So this is 60. So I will extend this line here and see where this intersects uh, the cumulative frequency curve. So it's almost at this point, which is uh, this one, one small block. So let me write, draw this a little bit neatly. So this is at this point, which is one small block to the right of this line here. So this will be this point here, which is 31. So your median is 31 liters. 90th percentile of the distribution will be uh, 90th percent of 120, which is uh, 0.90 into 120, which is the uh, when CF is 90th percent of 120, which is 108. So when CF cumulative frequency is 108, you have to find the value uh, of the liters. So 108 will be this one, uh, one small block below 110. So let's see where this uh, intercepts the graph. So it will be at this point. Which is, I believe, 54 so this is 55 so this will be 54 so the 90th percentile is 54 liters part d is on the same day garage b also recorded the amount of amount of petrol bought by its first 120 customers the results are summarized below so you have to draw the cumulative frequency curve for garage B on the grid. So using this uh, results, we will plot the points. So you're given that six customers bought 10 liters or less. So that means on the cumulative frequency uh, graph here. So I'll draw this in red. Six customers bought 10 liters or less. So that means when the petrol, the this is 10 liters, you have six customers who bought 10 liters or less. So on the y-axis, you will have six, which is this point here. So this is your first point. The next point given is the most petrol bought by any customer was 60 liters. So the maximum petrol uh, bought by a customer was 60 liters. And how many customers are there in total, which is 120 customers. So that means uh, here at 0.60 liters, you reach them all the customers, you cover all the customers, which are 120. So the maximum uh, bought by a single customer is 60 liters. So you have nothing 
after this point. So you there is no other value towards the right of 60. That means you reach the total customers or the total cumulative frequency at 120 at 60 liters here. The median amount of petrol bought was 34 liters. So the median is again when cumulative frequency value is uh, 60. So this is 60 and the median is given as 34. So 34 is right here. So this is the median value for garage V. The lower quartile of the distribution was 25 liters. So what is the lower quartile? Lower quartile is 25% of 120. Uh, so let's calculate this, which is 0 0.25 into 120, which is 30. So on, on the y-axis, you have 30. Uh, and then on the x-axis, the lower, uh, the lower quartile of the distribution was 25 liters. So at 30, you will have to, the x value will be 25 liters because the lower quartile value is 25. And then the last point is the interquartile range of the distribution was 19 liters. So what is the interquartile range? It's the lower court difference between the upper quartile and the lower quartile. So you're given that uh, lower quartile is 25. So let me actually write it here. Lower quartile is equals to 25 and inter quartile range is 19. So what will be the upper quartile? Upper quartile will be equals to 25 plus 19, uh, which is uh, 25, 35, 44. So that means uh, the, the upper quartile is 44. And what is the upper quartile? Upper quartile is 75th 75% of 120, which is what? So let me 0.75 of 120 will be 90. So cumulative frequency value is uh, at the 75th percentile is 90. So this is 90 and your upper quartile value is 44. So 44, this is 40, this is 45 and this is 44. So this is your uh, upper quartile. So this is upper quartile value 44 and then this is the lower quartile value which is 25 at 30. So now we have plotted. So we are given five statements here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and we have uh, plotted the five uh, corresponding points for each of those statements and now we can basically draw the cumulative frequency curve as well. We'll start off here. So this will be your uh, cumulative frequency curve for garage B. Part E is uh, petrol is priced at $2.60 per liter at both garages. Garage A offers a gift to customers who buy over 35 liters. Garage B offers a gift to customers who spend over $104. Use your graphs to estimate the number of these customers offered a gift at each garage and complete the sentence below. So the sentence is garage dash offers a gift to dash more customers than garage dash. So you have to basically find how many customers are offered a gift at each garage and then state which offers a gift to more customers by how many. So the difference, you have to calculate the difference as well. So let's first see garage A offers uh, a gift to customers who buy over 35 liters. So let's see how many customers buy over 35 liters from garage A. So this is 35 and it intercepts this curve at this point, uh, which is, so this is 35. So I'm looking at this line here 
and it intercepts the cumulative frequency curve at this point. So this value here will be this line here. So this is 73 customers bought 30, at least 35 liters. So how many bought more than 35? 120 minus 73. So customers offered gift at garage A will be 120 minus 73 because 73 is the number of customers who bought at least 35 liters of fuel, not more than 35, uh, at most 35, sorry. So at most 35 liters of fuel was bought by around 73 customers. So the rest of the customers above, above this line, so above this uh, graph, basically all the customers above this, which is 120 minus 73. So these customers are the customers who bought more than 35 liters and they uh, got the gift from garage so 120 minus 73 will be 120 minus 73 will be 47 so 47 customers uh, were offered a gift at garage a. so how many customers got a gift at garage b so garage b offers a gift to customers who spend over 104 dollars so that means uh, let's first convert. We need to convert it to uh, liters of petrol uh, because on the graph we have petrol and the cumulative frequency. So uh, liters bought in $104 equals to 104 divided by the price per liter which is 2.60. So this will be uh, 104 divided by 2.60 which is 40 so that means if someone buys petrol over 40 liters that means they will spend over 104 dollars uh, they will get uh, they will be given a gift uh, at garage b so we need to find the number of customers who bought more than 40 liters so now we need to look at this red curve here and if you look at this this is the you can take this point as the intersection point and straight away you can see that this is 80 here so this is 40 we need to find the number of customers so let me in fact do this in red so we have to find the number of customers who bought more than uh, 40 liters of fuel so this is 40 and it intersects here which is this line here So this is 80. So now you're looking for number of customers who bought more than uh, 40 liters, which is 120 minus 80. So we can write it here. Again, uh, customers offered gift at garage B is 120 minus 80 which is 40 so that means garage a offers a gift to seven more customers so 47 minus 40 is seven more customers than uh, garage b so this is how you will solve this part Question number eight is the table below shows uh, some values of x and corresponding values of y for y equals to one over four into two power x. So part A is complete the table. So this is the missing value. So we can use this equation to find the value of y when x equals to one. So this will be y equals to one by four into two power one, which is two over four, which is one over two. So this value here is 0 0.5. Part B is on the grid below, draw the graph of this equation. 
So we can plot these points given in this table here. So first point is 0 and 1 by 4 which is 0 0.25. So 0 is here then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.25 will be this value here. The next value is 1 and 0 0.5 which will be this value. So let me draw circles around this. 1 and 0 0.5 then 2 and 1 3 and 2, 4 and 4, and then 5 and 8. So this will be your sort of uh, the plot and then you can uh, draw the curve here. So let me try to draw the curve here. So this will be your curve for this uh, equation. Part C is by drawing a suitable line, find the gradient of your graph where x equals to 4. So x equals to 4 is this value here. So what I'll try to do is use a ruler to uh, draw a line such that it it is tangent at x equals to 4 so it just touches the curve at one point which is x equals to 4 so let me align my ruler here so that it basically just touches the line at x equals to 4 which will be somewhat like this maybe a little bit like this yeah so now I can just mark the points uh, so I cannot draw the line with the ruler here so I'll just uh, mark the point here and then mark another point here and then draw the straight line uh, without the ruler but you will use your ruler to draw this line so let me actually draw this in another color. So it will be from this point up till this point where it just touches the curve at x equals to four like this and then I can basically look at the x and y coordinates of the points here so this point here is uh, 4.567 so the x value is 4.7 and the y value is 6 and here this is 3.1 3.2 3.3 3 .3. so this point here is uh, 3.3 and 2. So to find the gradient uh, I will simply do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 so 6 minus 2 so over 4.7 minus 3.3 so the gradient here will be m will be uh, 6 minus 2 over 4.7 minus 1.3 4.7 minus 1.3 yeah so let me bring in the calculator here so this will be 4 divided by in fact let me first minus 4.7 minus 1.3 will be 3.4 and then 4 divided by uh, 3.4 sorry 4.7 minus 3.3 so this is not 1.3 this is 3.3 so 4.7 uh, minus 
4.7 minus 3.3 .3 is 1.4 and then 4 divided by 1.4 will be 2.86 so you have to write up till three significant figures when you have a uh, non-exact answer so this will be uh, 2.857 will be rounded off to 2.86 so your gradient will be 2.86 The next part is show that the line 2x plus y equals to 6 together with the graph of this can be used to solve the equation. So you're given this equation. So what I will do is I'll substitute the value of y into this equation here. So this will become uh, 2x plus y will be 1 over 4 into 2 power x uh, equals to 6. Then I can take the LCM here. So the LCM here will be 4 and this will be multiplied by 4. So this will be 8x uh, plus 2 power x equals to 6. Then I can take this 4 to the other side. This will become 8x plus 2 power x equals to 24. Uh, so since I have this negative 24 here, so I will bring this to this side so I will get 2 power x plus 8x minus 24 equals to 0. So now you have shown that this can be written as this equation. Part 2 is hence solve 2x plus 8x minus 24. So the solution of uh, the x value will be the uh, x coordinate of the intersection of this line with this curve. So you already drawn this curve in the first part. Uh, you can quickly uh, draw this line as well by plotting two points. So let's take uh, any two values of x. So let's say x equals to, uh, so I have positive x-axis and positive y-axis. So I'll just take x equals to 1, then 2x plus y equals to 6. Uh, in fact, let me make y the subject of the equation. So x equals to 1 and then if I make y the subject of the equation, I get y equals to 6 minus 2x. So when y x equals to 1, y equals to 6 minus 2, which is 4. And then when x equals to 2, y, equal, y will be 6 minus 2 times 2 is 4. So y will be 2. So I have two points, 1, 4 and 2, 2. So I can plot these two points to get the line. So 1, 4 will be this point here and 2 2 will be this point here so i can draw a straight line uh, through these two points which will give me uh, this line here so let's draw this from this point and then straight through this point and then this will be the point of intersection so let me make sure i draw this through this point and then the x coordinate of this will give you the uh, solution so let me see which one is the x so this is the x coordinate here so this is 2.5 then this is 2.4 so your x value here will be 2.4. Part E is uh, the points P and Q are 2, 3 and 5, 4 respectively. Find the gradient PQ. So gradient PQ will be uh, 4 minus 3 y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 which is 5 minus 2 which is uh, 3. So this will be 1 over 3. So answer is 1 over 3. On the grid, draw the line L parallel to PQ that touches the curve y equals to 1 over 4 into 2 power x. So you already are given two points, uh, 2, 3 and 5, 4. So let's mark these. 2, 3 is this point here. And then 5, 4 is this point here. So now you will align your ruler with these two points like this because the line that you have to draw will have the same gradient. So your 
when you align the ruler between these two points so this is now aligned so this is the line uh, between P and Q but we have to draw a line L so line L will have the same gradient now you have to move your ruler and see where I can draw the line where it just touches the uh, this line uh, this curve here blue curve at one point so it looks like it will be around this point uh, you have to make sure that your ruler is like aligned perfectly between P and Q and you keep it that way and move it around the curve and see where it will be tangent to the curve so it looks like it will be tangent around this point here or uh, this point so I can basically draw this line from this point so this will be one of my points here and the other point I can take is this one here so then I can just draw the curve so connect this point here with this point here again you can straight away use the ruler to draw this uh, line I my ruler doesn't work so I have to like mark the points and then draw the line afterwards so now you can see that this line is kind of tangent to the curve and this is your uh, line L so this will be your line L so you have drawn the line L parallel to PQ that touches the curve part 3 is write down the equation of line L so you already know the gradient of line L so M will be the same as the gradient of the line PQ because they are parallel uh, parallel to PQ so the gradient is 1 by 3 so your equation is 1 over uh, 3x plus C and then you can quickly uh, see the y intercept here so this is 0 0.1 this is 0 0.2 so this is between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 so I can call it 0. 1, 5. so you can write the equation the y-intercept is 0 0.15 so 1 over 3x plus 0 0.15 so your equation of line L is y equals to 1 over 3x plus 0 Question number 9, part A is the diagram shows a vertical wind turbine with blades 30 meter long. The blades are stationary with point A being the maximum distance possible from the horizontal ground. So this means this blade is perfectly vertical. That is why A is a maximum distance from this, from the ground. If this was not perfectly vertical, if it was even slightly to this point here, A will be a little lower if the blade was like this. So you're given that A is the maximum distance from the ground. So that means this blade is perfectly vertical. Uh, the point B is such that the angle of elevation of A from B is 34. So this is the angle of elevation of A from B, which is 34 degrees. And the angle of elevation of the center of the blades, this C from B is 25. So this is the angle of elevation of C from B which is 25 degrees calculate the distance AB so you have to calculate this distance AB so if this full angle is 34 this angle is 25 uh, that means that this angle here is 9 degrees so you know this angle is 9 degrees you have to basically uh, find this length here uh, I know this angle I know the opposite length right so if I can find out if this is a straight line here. So if I can find this angle, angle ACB, then I can use the sine rule because AB is opposite to this angle C. So I can use the sine rule because I know this side and the opposite angle. So I can use the sine rule to calculate AB. So uh, how do I find this angle ACB? I know that this is a vertical uh, wind turbine. So this angle here is 90 degrees. 
and this is the exterior angle of this triangle that is formed so this triangle that I'm marking in green here so this angle ACB is the sum of the interior opposite angle so this is the exterior angle of this triangle and we know that the exterior angle of a triangle is the sum of the two opposite interior angles so angle ACB will be equal to 90 plus 25 which is 115 degrees even if you do not know this property you can easily find this angle uh, by adding all the three angles of uh, the triangle to 180 degrees you know these two 90 and 25 you find this angle and then 180 minus this angle will give you the angle ACB so which is the same as the sum of the two uh, sum of these two uh, using the property that uh, the exterior angle of a triangle is equal to the sum of the two opposite interior angles which are the op which are opposite to the exterior angle so now you know ACB now I can use the sine rule so a length AB over sine of ACB sine of angle ACB will be equal to length AC over sine of this 9 degrees so then uh, or in fact sine of angle ABC angle ABC so then I can substitute the values this will give me so let me continue here AB over sine of ACB will be sine of 115 equals to AC is what 30 over sine of 9 so this will give me AB equals to 30 divided by sine of 9 multiplied by sine of 115 degrees so this will be 30 divided by sine of 9 and then multiplied by sine of 115 115 and then sine goes to 173.8 which is 173.8 and then you have to write your non-exact answers to uh, three significant figures so this will be 174 so this length AB is 174 meters. Part B is a different turbine shown in the diagram on the next page has the center of it, its blades F 75 meters from the base of the turbine D. So let me. So this length here the base of the turbine D is 75 meters away from this point F uh, and then point E is on the sloping ground 180 meters from F and 130 meters from D so this point here E is 180 meters from F and 130 meters from D calculate the angle of depression of E from F so the angle of depression of E from F will be so if I draw a horizontal line which is horizontal to the ground not this slope like it's horizontal to the or sorry it's parallel to the horizontal ground which will be like this so you have to find this angle which is the angle of uh, depression of E from F so this is a triangle here FDE is a triangle and I know the three sides of this triangle so that means I can use the cosine rule uh, to find this angle here so if I can find this angle this full angle is 90 degrees so this angle of depression will be uh, 90 minus angle DFE so this angle of depression is that we have is the one that we need to calculate so using the cosine rule uh, let's write it here using cosine rule I can write cos of this angle DFE DFE equals to the this length FD square so this length is FD 
squared plus this length 180 squared or in fact let me just write the alphabetical names plus fe square minus the opposite length of the angle so we're looking at angle dfe so the opposite length is this one which is 130 or length de de squared divided by 2 times fd multiplied by uh, fe so now i can substitute the values so this will be cos tf E will be FT square will be 75 squared plus FE squared will be 180 squared minus DE square is 130 square and then whole divided by uh, 2 times F into D FD which is 75 into uh, FE is 180 so if i calculate this so 75 squared 75 square plus 180 square plus 130 squared will be oh sorry minus 130 square so let me do this again this will be 75 square plus 180 square and then minus 130 square which is 21,000 so this will be 21 1 to 5 divided by uh, this one here will be 2 times 75 times 180 which is 27,000 so DFE angle will be cos inverse of 21,125 divided by 27,000. So this will be 21,125 divided by 27,000. And then you take the cos inverse of this, you get 38.518, which I can write as. 38.52 uh, correct to two decimal places so this is this angle here is 38.52 now your angle of depression of e angle of depression of e from f will be 90 minus 38.52 which is 90 minus 38.52 which is 51.48 but you have to write all your uh, angles and degrees correct to one decimal place so i can write it as 51.5 degrees so this will be 51.5 degrees the angle of depression of uh, e from f part c is point p is on the uh, point on a blade which is furthest from the center of the blade each blade is 30 meters long calculate the distance traveled by p as the blade completes one revolution so if you have these three blades here like this your point p is furthest from the center of the blade so this point any of these three uh, you can take any of the blades the point p will be right at the edge of the blade which is the furthest distance from the center and each blade is 30 meters so once they rotate this p will rotate in this sort of a circle and you have to calculate this distance that p travels in one rotation so this is actually the circumference of this circle which has a radius of 30 meters so distance traveled by point p by p will be 2 pi r 
and this will be r will be 30 so 2 pi into 30 so let's calculate that this will be 2 into pi into 30 which is 188.49 188.49 and then this is the non-exact answer so you have to write it up till three significant figures so this is four which is less than five so I will round this down to 188 so this will remain 188 so your answer here will be 188 meters the blade completes 15 rev revolutions per minute. Calculate the speed of P giving your answer in kilometers per hour. So your speed will be the distance traveled by point P in uh, then divided by uh, the time taken. So the blade completes 15 revolutions per minute. So let's first calculate distance in uh, one minute. In one minute will be equals to so there are 15 revolutions in one revolution it moves 188 meters so this will be 188 into 15 which is equals to uh, so 188 into 15 will be 2820 meters so this is 2820 meters and then you can write it into kilometers because you want the answers in, in kilometers per hour so divide by 1000 this will give you 2.82 kilometers per minute then distance in 60 minutes or in one hour will be so in one minute it's 2.82 so in 60 minutes it will be simply multiplied by 60 which is 2.82 uh, into 60 which is 169.2 so 169.2 kilometers so your speed is basically the distance traveled in time one hour which is again 169.2 divided by 1 which is simply 169.2 again so the speed is 169.2 kilometers per hour part 3 is the point Q lies on the straight line between P and the center of the blades Q travels 90 meter as the blade completes one revolution. Calculate PQ. So you're given that Q is some point that lies on this straight line between the center of the blades and this point uh, P. So let's assume this is point Q here and it will travel this distance in one revolution, right? So this Q will move like this in one revolution and you're given that this distance is 90 meters. So Basically, we can find the radius of this circle, which is the same as this length. So if we can find the radius, we know that this full length is 30, then PQ will be 30 minus this radius R. So uh, to find PQ, first let's find the this value R. Uh, you're given that 90 equals to 2 pi R, and then R will be 90 divided by 2 pi. So this will give you 90 divided by 2 into uh, pi. And this will give you 14.323. So this is 14.3 meters. Then length PQ is simply 30 minus. So this length PQ here is 30. This 30 full length up till the center minus this R. So 30 minus 14.3, uh, which is uh, 30 minus 14.3, just 15.7. So your answer is 15.7 meters. Question number 10 is triangle ABCD are drawn on a centimeter square grid below. Uh, the perimeter of triangle A is A plus square root B centimeters where A and B are integers. Find A and B. So to calculate the perimeter, this length for A you can see is 1, 2 blocks. So this is 2. This length here is 1. So we can find this hypotenuse here. 
so hypotenuse of a will be 1 square plus 2 square and then whole under root so this is under root 5 then what will be the perimeter perimeter will simply be the sum of all sides so 2 plus 1 plus square root 5 which is 3 plus square root 5 so a is what a is 3 and b is uh, this value here 5 part b is triangle a is mapped onto triangle b by the translation t write down the column vector that represents t so let's call the translation vector translation vector t equals to uh, let's call this t1 and t2 so this a let's take one point so this point is 1 1 and it moves to minus 5 uh, and 4 so your translation vector you know that uh, if you have an uh, object you add the translation vector to get its image so to get the translation vector you will simply minus the original object uh, coordinates from the image coordinates so t1 t2 vector will be simply the image which is minus 5 so we are looking just at this one point image is minus 5 and 4 so this is minus 5 and 4 which is the image co coordinates and then the original object coordinates are 1 and 1 minus 1 and 1 so this will give you minus 6 and 3 so this will be minus 6 and 3 part b is described fully single transformation that maps triangle b onto triangle c so this triangle b is mapped onto this triangle c so this is not a translation because you can see that the orientation has changed this is also not a rotation because if this was rotated like this uh, the triangle will look something like uh, not like this in fact it will look if you rotate this 90 degree like this uh, you will get something like this but if you look at this triangle C it's the mirror image of this so it's the the orientation is flipped that means it's a reflection so now we have to find uh, what is the line of reflection so to find the right line of reflection I can simply uh, connect any two points uh, from the image uh, from the original object to the image so let's this point corresponds to this point here so I will connect these two here so let me draw a line here in fact I can just connect it like this so if I connect these two points via straight line they will pass through this origin so now you know that uh, this distance is equals to this distance so this is the middle point here you can also find midpoints using the coordinates so there are two ways to find the line of reflection either you connect the points uh, corresponding points and then find the midpoint so if you look at that this distance here it is equals to this distance here so this is the, the origin is the midpoint and then uh, let's take any other two points so if I take this point and this point the x coordinates are 4 and minus 5 so 4 minus 5 divided by 2 will give me the mid uh, x coordinate which is minus uh, 0 0.5 so this is the x and then y coordinate of this is uh, minus 5 and 4 so minus 5 plus 4 divided by 2 and then this is the y mid coordinate of uh, the midpoint so the midpoint of the line which joins these two points is minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 so now you have two points 0 0 and minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 so you're looking at a line of reflection which is like this so what is this line this line has an equation y equals to x so that this transformation that transforms triangle B onto triangle C is a reflection a reflection in line y equals to x so let me just erase these so that's how you find the line of reflection
पार्टी इज डिस्क्राइब फुली सिंगल ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन दैट मैप्स ट्राइंगल बी ऑन टू ट्राइंगल डी सो बी इज मैप ऑन टू डी सो यू कैन क्लियरली सी द साइज हैज चेंज सो दिस इज सर्टनली एनलार्जमेंट सो टू फाइंड द सेंटर ऑफ एनलार्जमेंट यू कनेक्ट corresponding points and the lines connecting those points will intersect at the center of enlargement so if i look at this point this point the corresponding point in b is this one so this will line will go through this straight line like this and then i can join any other two points so if i take this point here then this point is the corresponding point in triangle b and then if i draw a straight line it will uh the straight line will look like this it will pass through this point here like this so this is your center of enlargement uh, which is minus 4 and 2 and what about the scale factor you can uh, either look at the corresponding lengths so if you look at this length b the length d is double so the less length is 4 and this length is 2 that means the scale factor is 2 but it is minus 2 because the image is on the other side of the center of enlargement when the image is on the so this is your center of enlargement so when the image is on the opposite side of the center of enlargement uh, the scale factor has a negative sign if the both the image and the original object are on the same side of the center of enlargement then the uh, scale factor is positive and you can also look at the lengths of these lines so if this length from the center of enlargement up till this point is this much uh, this length is twice so this gives you the scale factor is 2 uh, but negative 2 since the image is on the opposite side of the uh, center of enlargement so this uh, single transformation is enlargement enlargement with scale factor minus 2 and center will be Um, minus four and two. So your center was this one, which is minus four and two. So this is how you will find this. Part E is write down the matrix that represents the transformation which maps triangle D onto triangle A. So triangle D onto triangle A. again this will be an uh, enlargement because the size has changed from d to a now if you uh, connect the corresponding points this point will connect to this and this point is a straight line which connects to this point so the two lines intersect at this point and again uh, now the scale factor is half because this length is 4 and when d is mapped on to a the length becomes 2 so now you have you know that this is enlargement around this origin with scale factor uh 1 by negative 1 by 2 because the uh image is on the other side of the center of enlargement so you know that this is enlargement enlargement uh with scale factor Minus one by two, and center zero zero. Now you have to find the matrix that represents this transformation. So you can easily find the matrix using the technique that you have learned. You take two points. One point is one zero, and the other point is zero and one. Now apply this enlargement uh, of scale factor minus one by two at center zero zero. So if I connect this point to this center. this length is 1 so it will move uh, half the distance on the other side so this will move to this point which is minus 1 by 2 and 0 so this is a this is a dash and what will happen to b this point b the this distance is 1 and this is the center of enlargement so if this distance is 1 it will move half the distance on the other side half the distance on the other side because the scale factor is half and minus signs means that it will move on the opposite side of the center of enlargement which is this origin so this will move to this point b dash which is what uh, 0 and minus 1 by 
so this here is 0 and minus 1 over minus 1 over 2 so now your matrix is simply the column vectors of point a dash and p dash so a dash is minus 1 by 2 and 0 and b dash is 0 minus 1 by 2 so that's how you find the transformation matrix Part F is uh, the transformation V is a reflection in the line Y equals to 0. The transformation W is a rotation 90 degree clockwise about 0, 0. The single transformation X is equivalent to the transformation V followed by the transformation W. The point GH is mapped onto the point P by the uh, transformation X. Find the coordinates of P. So now you can use the, again, find the matrix first and then apply the transformation to this point uh, GH to find where it is mapped to, uh, which is like the point P. So you have to find the coordinates of point P. So let's first find the transformation matrix. So let's first look at this V, which is a reflection in Y equals to zero. So if you have a reflection in Y equals to zero, uh, reflection, so let me just move this calculator out of the way. So reflection in y equals to zero. So if you have a point again using the same te technique, if you have point one zero and the point uh, zero one, reflection in y equals to zero is this line y, which is the x-axis. So this is the line of reflection. So what happens? Once you reflect these points, you will one zero will remain at one zero. Zero one will come here, which will be zero minus one. So this is your transformation matrix for V. Then do the same for uh, W, which is a rotation. So a rotation 90 degree clockwise about zero zero. So again, you take the point one, zero and zero, one. So now you do the rotation. So 90 degree clockwise. So if I join this point with the center is this, then 90 degree clockwise will bring me here. Same distance. So one, zero will become uh, zero minus one. And then zero, one, I will join here with the center of rotation then 90 degree clockwise will bring me to one zero so this is a and this is a dash and then this is b and b dash is basically the original position of a so b dash is one zero so your vector oh, sorry the matrix for this transformation w is simply a dash which is zero minus one and b dash is one zero so your transformation x is v followed by w so x will be uh, w v v then followed by w so what is uh, w here i'll replace w and v in this equation so i will have 0 minus 1 1 0 and v is 1 0 0 minus 1 so if you calculate this 0 1 and then 1 0 this will be 0 this will be minus 1 uh, this minus one zero multiplied by this column one zero will give me minus one and this minus one zero and then zero minus one will give me zero So this is the matrix for the transformation X now you can apply this to point P uh, to this point GH to find the co coordinates of point P so P will be this transformation matrix zero minus one minus one zero multiplied by uh, this point here uh, G H so G G H so this will be 0 times G and minus 1 times H so this will be minus H and this will be minus G so the coordinates are of P are minus H and minus G part B is describe fully the single transformation X so if you again use the same techniques two points at one and zero and zero and one 
So if you look at this, this is A, this is point A, and this is point A, da uh, sorry, A, B. And the, where does A end up? A end up at A dash, which is zero minus one. So zero minus one is this point. So this is A dash zero and minus one and B ends up at minus one zero. So minus one zero is this point, minus one and zero. This is B dash. So A moved from here to here and B moved from here to here. So this is a reflection across this line. So this is the midpoint and B moved, uh, B was reflected across this line to this point here, B dash, and A was reflected across this line to this point here uh, at A dash. So what is the equation of this line? This is Y equals to minus X. If you can't uh, like judge it from this visualization, you can actually calculate the midpoints of these two point B and B dash, find the midpoint of A and A dash, and then you will get that these midpoints are minus uh, 0 0.5 and plus 0 0.5. And this midpoint here is uh, 0 0.5 and minus 0 0.5. So these two points will give you the equation of the line, which is Y equals to minus X. So the single transformation X is uh, reflection in y equals to minus x. The next question is, uh, solid one is a cylinder with a small cylinder removed from its center as shown in the diagram. So the radius small uh, cylinder is R and the radius of this cylinder is R plus 3.5. So this here length is r as well and then the radius of the larger cylinder will be r plus 3.5 which is 3.5 centimeter greater than the radius of small cylinder the volume of this solid is given and the height is also given uh, you have to calculate this value r which is the radius of the small cylinder so what is this volume of the cylinder volume of this solid solid one is volume of this large cylinder which has radius r plus 3.5 minus the volume of this small cylinder which is removed which has a radius of r so volume of solid one equals to volume of large cylinder minus volume of small cylinder So volume is given 3000. What is the volume of the large cylinder? It is pi r square h and r is what? r plus 3.5. So this is r plus 3.5 pi r square into h height is uh, 20 plus minus the volume of smaller cylinder which is pi r square and the height is again the same which is 20. So now uh, I can open this uh, bracket, take the square. I will get 3000 equals to pi into uh, using the formula a plus b whole square equals to a square plus 2ab plus b square. So this is r square plus 2ab, which is 2 into 3.5 into r, which is 7r plus uh, 3.5 square will be 12.25 and then into 20 minus this will be as it is which is uh, 20 pi r square now if i open this bracket uh, and multiply 20 pi with each of these let's see what i get 3000 equals to this will give me 20 pi r square plus 140 pi r plus 20 times 12.25 will be 245 pi and then minus this is 20 pi r squared this will be minus 20 pi r squared so this plus 20 pi r squared and minus 20 pi r squared will cancel out so i will get 3000 equals to uh, 140 pi r 
plus 245 pi and then I can take this 245 pi to the other side so I will get 140 pi r equals to 3000 minus 245 pi and r will be 3000 minus 245 pi divided by 140 pi. So let's quickly calculate this. So 3000 minus uh, 245 pi, 245 into pi. So this is 2230, this divided by 140 pi. 140 into uh, pi, close the bracket. So your answer is 5.07. So 5.0709 and then I will have to write it up till 3. Uh, significant figures so this is 0 so 7 will remain 7 so I will get 5.07 uh, the unit is centimeters so your radius R is 5.07 centimeters part 2 is uh, solid 2 is a cone with volume 3000 the perpendicular height of the cone is twice its radius which solid is taller and by how much? So you're given the formula for the volume of the cone at the top here, which is one by three pi r square h. So you're given that, let's say, uh, let radius equals to r. So if this radius here is r, then you're given that the height is twice the radius. So this height here will be two r. So height, equals to 2r. Now we can find the value of r by equating it to the volume. So volume equals to 1 by 3 pi r square h. Volume is 3000 equals to 1 by 3 into uh, pi into r square is this r square and then h is what? 2r. So this will be 3000 equals to uh, this will become cube here. So this will be 2r cube over 3 into pi. So this is cube. And then r cube will be uh, 3000 into 3 divided by 2 pi, which is, let's calculate this. So this will be 3000 into 3 uh, divided by 2 into pi. So this is 1432.394 and then continuing here r will be simply the cube root of this value 1432.394 so r is I can uh, take the cube root of this which will be simply power 1 divided by 3 which is the cube root so I will get 11.2725 so this is 11 right 11 point two seven two five. Uh, the unit is centimeters. So this is R. You have to find the height because you're comparing the uh, heights of the two solids. So then uh, let me continue here. So your height height equals to 2R which is uh, I'll multiply this by 2 to get 22.545. So 20 22.545 and then I can write it up till three significant figures so this will be 22.5 centimeters so what was the height of the previous solid it was 20 so difference will be 
its difference is 22.5 minus 20 which is 2.5 centimeters so this height 22.5 of this cone is bigger so solid 2 is solid 2 is taller by 2.5 centimeters 2.5 centimeters the next part is the diagram shows a triangular prism of length 24 in its cross section is an equilateral triangle of side 8 centimeters so all these sides will be 8 because it is an equilateral triangle calculate the total surface area of the prism so the surface area of the prism will be the uh, area of this front side area of this bottom area of this back side and the area of this front and the this back so these are three rectangles this the back and the bottom are rectangle the front and the back side are the so this right left and bottom is the rectangle the front and the back are the triangles so area will be equals to the two times the area of these triangles so there are two triangles the this length is uh, 8 and this angle is 60 degree because it is an equilateral triangle so I can use the formula of the uh, area of triangle is 1 by 2 into uh, the two sides 8 and 8 and the sine of the angle between them which is sine 60 degrees and I'm multiplying this by 2 because there are two triangles the front and the back and then uh, I will add the area of the three rectangles the this one on the right this one on the left and the one at the bottom so three times the area of rectangle is simply the length and width which is 24 into 8 so this let's calculate this 1 divided by 2 into 8 into 8 into uh, sine of 60 degrees so sine of 60 so let me first calculate the sine so sine of 60 60 sine into 8 into 8 and then divide by 2 in fact you have to multiply it by 2 on the outside as well so those cancel out so these 2 and 2 can cancel out so I will get 55.425 plus 24 into 8 into 3 so 24 into 8 into 3 576 576 so this will be 576 plus 55.425 which is 631.425 631.425 and then I will write it down to one uh, sorry three significant figures which will be uh, these three this is four so I will simply uh, round it down to 631 uh, centimeter square so this is your area uh, of this triangular prism so 631 centimeter square so this was the end of paper 2 variant 2 for May June 2016